David, welcome to the Inside Out Leadership Podcast, my friend. Thanks, Rob. Love it. I'm so excited to be here and have this conversation. Man, you and I, it didn't take long, did it? We were, you know, I was referred to you from a friend. And uh, and he says, this brother, you've got to talk to because he has it going on, uh, <laughs> not just in what you do as a, as a, as a profession, right? We're going to get into that today. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, based on who you are and your life's journey. So I thought an appropriate place to start which is not unfamiliar of most, most guests that we have on, is what's a story that might let us into David Chada's life a bit more? So as we continue in this conversation, people are going to be like, yeah, I get this guy. Yeah, I'm with <laughs> Like, What would you say? Yeah, so um, this last week, I just started writing my next book. I don't have a title for it yet, but the first chapter is called um, What is a Hopeful and Desirable Life? And this story I want to tell you as one I'm just meditating in right now because I'm writing about it, but it just happened about two or three weeks ago. And uh, my daughter, who's 18, is graduating high school. And she um, came to have some courage to say, Mom, Dad, I'm not 100% sure about what I, what I want to do. I said, okay, well, let's pause on college together and let's do a year and let's queue up some experiences for you. Things you're interested in. So I've got this old car I've been working on. It's in my basement. It's a 1969 Mercury. And um, it's, that's a whole other podcast, man. Like, let's do yeah, another one gonna, on the, oh, on I the car. Gonna, I got to interrupt here for a moment. <laughs> you just say that so casually. I mean, that, that's something that uh, I'm viewing it like hard labor, sweating <laughs> nonstop. Where does David have the time for this? But keep going. <laughs> A lot of frustration. I've had so many times where I've been like, I quit. And I actually had a friend of mine one time who said, gird up your loins and keep on going. You're, <laughs> you've come too far. Yeah. And this might be appropriate in your podcast. I don't know, but my son goes, what does that mean? It, I was like, son, it means pick up your balls, <laughs> pick them up and keep working. <laughs> and keep going, keep going. <laughs> anyway, so I got this old car and um, a friend of mine said, hey, I want to put that in the movie. I'd put a picture on Instagram and I said, no, thanks. It's kind of far drive. My daughter uh, said, dad, come on. That's the reason why we're doing this year. So we packed everything up, put it on a trailer and went to Florida to help, so she could shadow a director of a movie and hang out with the actors. I became sort of like support team. So the car is driven by a detective in a horror, a comedy horror movie, like can't be comedy horror movie. And there's this genetically modified crocodile. He's killing people. And the detective's like, what's going on? He drives around my old car. No. Way. And um, anyway, but we're hanging together in Florida, doing this movie, taking some sweet time together. And, um, you know, we took it, one, had one day off. Anything artistic is a little tedious. So we, we were like, you know, we're tired. Let's take a day off. So on my birthday, we sat at the beach, just the two of us eating some tacos, spent most of the day in quiet together. So it's like on one hand, movie, horror movie. On another hand, you know, a solitude and tacos with my daughter. And the reason I can do this, though, is because I've chosen to order my life in such a way to be able to be available for my family. And I haven't always been great at that, um, but I'm getting better at it. So the you, as you know, the blessing of doing leadership development work or speaking or anything with teams is it's not every single day and you can organize your schedule around it. So anyway, so that's a little bit about who I am and some of the fun I like to have, you know, I with my family it. when I can. I love it. Well, you know, I think it would be appropriate too. I, I don't think I've ever done this on the podcast, but I'm going to do it today. <laughs> let's go. Sing you happy birthday. Okay. Oh, let's so, go. So the bottom line is happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear David. Happy birthday to yes. you. Yes. Thank you, man. You're good at that. Do you have an album? No album, <laughs> but I will say this in my family, you're speaking of your family. So thank you for taking us in. In my family, <laughs> we try to beat each other to the punch and wishing each other a happy birthday. Dare I say, sing happy birthday. Yeah, so yeah, like right. if it's my mom's birthday, which matter of fact is coming up in about a week, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, I have an older brother, younger sister. It's like, who was the first one to call mom? Not just to wish her happy birthday, but to oh. say happy birthday. Like, <laughs> I have one up on you because I beat you by my <laughs> you know so, i love it uh, anyway welcome to the family my brother thank you um, man i appreciate that hey as family and prioritizing family has 
becomes so meaningful to you, something that you're very intentional about. Uh, as many listeners to the podcast know, uh, this is season three of the podcast, which has everything to do with legacy. And I know so many different people, so many leaders um, involve their family and their legacy, but it's even more than their family. It's some deep-seated things in their heart that they want to see come to pass, even when they're no longer here. You know, it's their leave behind upon the earth. For you, as you take a deeper look at your legacy, what do you want your legacy to be, David? I think it it has a lot to do with my own emotional health and breaking some of the patterns that I think were in my family. And there's um, a quote I read by, I think his name was Paruatek. He was one of the rulers of the Inca empire. My, um, my grandfather was a full Inca from the mountains of Peru. My dad's from Peru. And Paruatek said, um, one who cannot govern his family should not be given power over people. Mm. And I read that years ago and I thought, wow, I think that's been my journey is I have natural gifts, but if I don't have emotional health with, that's manifest in the healthy lives of my kids and of my wife, um, my power over people is going to be a little bit skewed and bears a lot of potential to corrupt people. I'm strong. You should be strong too. I'm gifted. You should be gifted too. So what happens when you're not? Well, I need to be able to say, to have a settled presence and a settled body to be able to say, actually, I'm not doing well right now. I need to go out for a walk for a little bit and I'll come back. Yeah. Because when we can learn how to do that, the people around us see how to do it too. And so like with my daughter, right? To For her to be able to have the, the comfort level to eventually say, I'm not really sure I'm clear on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have that. I mean, I thought I have to really... Um, appear confident. And that got me a long way in life. But the problem is that that's also what led to a mental breakdown I had years ago, which I can tell you more about that in a sec. Yeah. But, but I think that it's in getting the emotional health to be able to be a steady, settled presence. So I can multiply that within my family and within the people I serve in their lives. You know, so many leaders, um, they may talk about uh, mental and emotional health, they may even believe in it. They might even help others with it to at least some degree. But very few are willing to explore uh, the deepest place of who they are because it's a very vulnerable place. And they're mm -hmm. afraid of what they might find if they go on this self-exploration. Yeah. You devote your life to help leaders navigate through those waters. Mm -hmm. But... You do it because it's something you're devoted to personally. You see, mm -hmm. you can help as many people as possible. I know a lot of leadership uh, development people and coaches, but they spend more time helping others and less time helping themselves. <laughs> you are one of the rare gems. And I mean this, David, you are one of the rare gems that really consistently and intentionally um, is helping yourself in that way, serving yourself in that way so that you can more effectively help others within your mm -hmm. sphere of influence and network. So I applaud yeah. you for that. It's admirable. Yeah. And I just say, thank you for mm -hmm. your continual Thanks. work you're doing on yourself. And as a natural byproduct, people are benefiting. They become the mm -hmm. beneficiaries. Can you take us yeah. into your own mental health journey a little bit? Oh boy. Wow. Hmm. Well, wow. How do we sum that one up? <laughs> um, you know, I think that my, my mental health journey by the way, when we talk about mental health, I think what we need to really clarify is it's really what are all the components we need to have around us so that we can be well or the well-being, you know, uh, phrase there. Because I think I've been I've been realizing recently when people talk about mental health these days, really what they talk, their meaning is their mental unhealth. <laughs> great <laughs> like, point. I gotta go, That's a great point. I, I got to go work on my mental health, which means I'm a basket case and I need to go talk about it because I haven't been. Hmm. So. So I think that for me, um, a little bit of my own story, I'll just start out by saying, love my parents, great people in their own ways, but in many ways, they both really damaged me. And, you know, we live in such a, a culture where we're, we have a hard time saying what's true about our elders because we think it will dishonor them. Sure. And I want to just clarify that, um, 
telling the truth is not dishonoring mm. because we are actually, we are more than the worst thing we've ever done. I am more than the worst thing I've ever done. You are too. And I can still say what's true about my parents and love them like crazy. Mm. And, and so I'll just tell you, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of uh, chaos and disorder, screaming and fighting. And um, there's, that's a whole other set of books right there. But what, what that did to me, though, was it taught me to really monitor the world for control and protection so that I didn't have to go through that again. And so that got me a long way as far as my ability to inspire and lead and organize. But, you know, it, it really, the way I, I think about it is it's like um, this, this ride that's going really fast in a car and you hit a, a bump or a jump or a pothole and the car flips over and skids on its roof to a stop. And for me, that's what happened to me at 37. Mm -hmm. And I met with some counselors and spiritual directors and said, what's going on with me? And they said, well, tell us about your life. And I said, well, I've moved my family like five times between major cities. I've started multiple iterations of my business. I've done all these things. And here's the, the type of home life I grew up in. And they said, well, you're a little ahead of schedule, but based on what you're describing, um, you are having a mental breakdown a little ahead of schedule. It mm -hmm. typically happens sometime in your forties or fifties. And so at 37, I had to slow down and, and say, how do I get some care here? I've been caring for the world for a long time. So I joined a grief group. My mother had died. Um, I began to start to see skilled counselors and therapists and have done a lot of personal retreats in the last couple of years to really help me face my story and deal with, um, honestly, my shame, which has to do with my own um, perceived sense of inadequacy. And any of us, whenever we feel inadequate to a task, shame is at play. And the way that we can get victory over shame is by naming the real facts that happened. Mm -hmm. Telling the truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, communicating the real feelings to a skilled listener or to the, the another person who was maybe involved. And then being able to work it out of your body and um, because it lodges in there. And I think many people who are um, skilled at leading others, unfortunately, don't realize they're leading out of their shame. Mm. And what they're doing is they're saying, I'm actually going to control you so I don't have to face me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, when I think about my own well-being, it's been me learning to say, I need to face me first before I face you. So it's like those Mm -hmm. You know, what are the, it's, um, I don't know what they call it, but there's these types of conflicts and stories, man versus man, man versus yeah. nature, yep. man versus self, you know, mm -hmm. and I've done all those, but the hardest one by far is man versus self. Ooh. So, <laughs> um, that's so good. <laughs> okay. So you're getting, entering into the shame aspect, the importance, um, of understanding what shame is that so many different human beings and leaders are operating and functioning and leading out of a place of shame. Mm -hmm. um, let's get as practical as we possibly can with this. Like if I'm a listener, a leader listening, and I want to begin my personal exploration, like I'm ready, I'm willing, um, but might be asking like, what are some things I can do to kind of own my own issues? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sick and tired of putting them on other people. It doesn't get me anywhere. Matter of fact, it does more damage than good. Yeah. For once in my life, I want to turn the attention to me mm -hmm. in a good way, a healthy yeah. way. But I don't know how. I don't know what steps to take. What practical things can they do, David, to help own <laughs> their own issues? Yeah. Well, I so as part of my work, I do retreats with leaders. And this this conversation comes up. In fact, I just sent someone home this morning, right before I got on this conversation. And so maybe to illustrate an answer, I'll just tell you a, a slice of his story and what I told him just last night, actually. Um, this is a gentleman. He's a leader from the country of Ukraine. He's spending, or sorry, not Ukraine, uh, Slovakia, right next to Ukraine. He told me earlier in this retreat, he said, I had to leave my country to feel calm. Mm. 
And I was like, you got a problem, man. <laughs> because yeah. here's the thing, you know, the studies show that our own happiness and peace is 50% genetic. <laughs> it's 10% um, circumstantial and it's 40% your attitude about it. Hmm. So we can't control a war. So he has 14,000 people a day pouring into his city yeah. in Slovakia from Ukraine. And he says, I have to do something. I'm already burned out, but I have to do something for these people. And his credit, what he's doing there is very inspiring, but he's giving his last drops of life. And, um, and it's admirable, but on one hand, he won't sustain that for his whole life. So how can he care for himself? So he said, what can I do? What can I do? And his story is he was raised by two deaf parents. Hmm. He speaks six languages. He's wow. brilliant. And he refers to sign language as his mother tongue, which is interesting. Isn't that something? Yeah. But he was but he was wired at a young age to believe I have to be present to help everybody else. Well, so this is a really great example of a leader who is leading out of shame. Um, he feels inadequate. And so he's going to help everybody else instead of paying attention to his own needs. He said, David, I bought a watch that shows me how stressed I am. And I said, okay, so here's the deal. You already know what to do to take care of yourself. You just aren't in touch with it. You know in your head, but you're not paying attention to your body. So you bought a watch to tell you what your body is telling you. <laughs> he was like, wow, I never thought of that. I was like, so good, good job. Step number one. <laughs> but step, step number two is you actually need to get to a place where you don't need your watch to tell you what your body is doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are you doing some belly diaphragm breathing or are you just breathing from your chest? Chest breathing raises your anxiety. Belly breathing slows you down. Um, so I talked to him about that. So another thing that you need to be thinking about is writing down some stories in your life. They're the, they're the trauma loops, like in a movie where you see an explosion happening over and over again, somebody's ears ringing. That's a trauma loop. Our brains work that way. We have stories inside of us that loop over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to write those down. We've got to name the real facts, the real feelings. And we've got to be able to sit with a skilled listener who's attuned like I have a good friend of mine who says, um, what we really need in this world is attuned relationships. So to be able to be settled when you're with another person requires you to be settled when you're with yourself. So paying attention to your body, paying attention to your story. And I think another um, thing that, that people can do is to be able to pay attention to the things that they do that um, they have energy for. Mm-hmm. So for instance, I just talked to another person this morning after my friend left. I got these leaders calling me all the time. This is another- How early do you get up, David? This is what I want to know and everyone else who's listening. <laughs> 5.30, man. I'm not proud of it. It's my it's my bad, overly responsible <laughs> habit. I'm responsible for the world. 5.30 every day. But um, <laughs> But anyway, but one more. And he says to me, he was like, David, he goes, I was out today. And I was just so, so frustrated with my day. I just thought, I'm going to speed today and see if I get pulled over. <laughs> He's driving so fast <laughs> down the road. <laughs> oh so, so I was like, okay, man, we got a problem here. Yeah. Because what your body is telling you is you need to slow down and you're hoping someone will force you to slow down. That's exactly right. Yeah. So maybe a police officer will catch me and force me to slow down. So intuitively... We know we need to slow down, but the trick is not looking to the outside world to do it for you. Mm -hmm. You doing it for yourself, because ultimately no one's going to speak up for you. You have to speak up for you. Well, I love that because inside out leadership is all about instead of letting exterior things try to get into your heart and your mind, why not start on the inside, your mm -hmm. heart and your mind and, and, uh, and, and begin to go through a process uh, overcome some obstacles with the help of others in the midst of that process, only to see good, healthy things work themselves out. Mm -hmm. So that's right, man, your message could mm -hmm. not be any more on point and alignment with inside out leadership. So you have authored yeah. a recent book, which mm -hmm. by the way, I want to encourage everyone who's listening, you got to pre-order your copy. Today. Mm -hmm. The book is called executive retreats for busy business leaders. I love that title, by the way, executive mm -hmm. retreats for busy business leaders. And I will put in the show notes, 
uh, a link to where you can pre-order that book. So please, if you are mm -hmm. listening to this and you've been intrigued and inspired by our conversation, by David's insight, practical guidance, you're gonna wanna get a copy of this book regardless of where you are on your inside out leadership journey. So why mm -hmm. is that you've already entered into this space, but I want to leave a little bit more room for you to elaborate for some further points, but like this area of retreating, mm -hmm. um, why is it so important for you? I mean, I think we can make a pretty good guess at this point, knowing your heart, where you come from, your own personal journey and what you're offering for others. Mm -hmm. but like why is retreating so important? What is it? Why is it important? Mm -hmm. So what is it? Maybe a way to think about it is the word retreat comes from two Latin words, retraher, which means to draw back, to attract a literal space. And if you think about, um, you know, the, the, the wisdom uh, writings of old, people going out to the desert, people, you know, like even in more modern um centuries guys like john muir going out into the wilderness you know to find his soul you know there's there's something important to to the word place so like if we any of us look around to where we're sitting right now it dictates what we think about so like on my desk i have um a wireless router i have a bunch of books you know my apple watch and my phone is facing up right now i shouldn't do that so i'm gonna turn it over right now so it dictates what you think about so so that's what a retreat is it's a drawing back to a literal tract or a space for the sake of regrouping regathering taking care of yourself and by the way, I agree so that you can be productive in the world. But what I've been thinking about a lot recently is it's actually the way that we're designed. Mm -hmm. So it's actually to get in line with our design. And depending on your worldview, I think it's a divine right. And it's a way that we're wired to be able to rest, to slow down, to get clear on our thoughts, to get clear on our vision. And why it's so important is because... Um, it is woven into the fabric of our genetic wiring. Why do you think we go to sleep every night? <laughs> most, most of us. <laughs> um, and so, so it's actually a learning to get in line with actually how we're designed to, to function. And one of the reasons it's important for me is back to what I was saying a moment ago, is I began to pay attention a few years ago to what I had energy for. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I said, you know, I was really getting tired doing a lot of traveling. I still do uh, leadership development for companies and I do executive offsites for executive teams. And those are great. And, but they're a little more detailed work. And I, though I can do details where I'm really at my best is when I do deep time with myself, with God. Um, and when I'm with others, it's deep time with another person. And so I began to to pay attention and say, you know, I really have more fun and I'm more effective when I have deeper time with people. As you know, it's like when you do a coaching relationship with somebody, it's anywhere from three to six months and then it's over, maybe. Sometimes it goes a little bit longer, but it's these little time slices, you know, mm -hmm. and so, so deep time gives you a few days with somebody. And uh, so I was like, I have more energy for that. And I noticed the results actually were better for what felt like a shorter amount of time. You know, it's like, it's this, this concept of flow. Like for me, when I'm working on my car or running or riding my bike, or maybe reading a great book, I lose track of time. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know, the world needs me and I need me to be more true to who I am. And I function better when I operate like this. So I bring people here to stay with me or stay in a great hotel in the city where I live, which is in Chattanooga. And we spend the morning working on their values and vision, looking at their lives, looking at the needs of their, um, their organization, how they can uniquely connect with that, given their calling and their unique way of communicating and being in the world. And then we take the afternoons to go do whatever they want. Hey, you want to go a hike? Want to go mountain Love bike? That. Want to want to go drink some whiskey? Um, <laughs> you know, or or take a nap? You know, go get a massage, whatever. And so, if they need more time with me, we do it. And if not, I I set them free. I heard Seth Godin say years ago. He said, "Peace is the new rich." That's really good. 
So really what, what I'm trying to do for myself and for my clients is help them grow rich through getting peace. And I think that you get that when you're with, again, back to what I said earlier, an attuned, settled presence. And I'm getting there. I mean, I haven't always been that way, but I've, I've done a lot of work to get there. So that's what that's why it's important for me. But you know what? You and I talked before we hit the record button about your message of retreating and your the new release of your book could not be more timely. I mean, David, I think we both agree on this, that a message that you've been experiencing personally and you've been sharing and having others experience in and through you, um, you've been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. However, there's a receptivity with leaders today that arguably just wasn't there three or four years ago. And I think because of what COVID has revealed to us, uh, transparency, some more authenticity, the need um, to ask for help and, and mm-hmm. involve others in the process. So I'm meeting more and more leaders that are putting their hand up to mm-hmm. say, I'm in, I want help in this area because I want to be the best version of myself. So I just want to say, thank you for your timely message. Mm. Thank you for your heart of deep conviction and boldness for you to continue to be you and you to continue to explore deep within yourself so you can give more of who you are away to Mm. others. Really, really appreciate you. I love that. So as we close the podcast, I want to leave a little bit more space, like any kind of parting word. We've talked about a lot today about emotional health, about retreating, owning your own issues, and they all go hand in hand. But like if there's if there's a takeaway you want people to have, further insight, a nugget of wisdom, this is your time. Mm, share. Thank so you. Feel free. Uh, I heard a recent interview with the 21st Surgeon General of the United States, and uh, Vivek Murthy is his name. And they were asking him his opinions on well-being. And he was talking a lot about what we were we were unpacking today. And he he asked this question. He said, what makes a happy person? We're being sold a bill of goods in this country that involves wealth, money, or sorry, money, sorry, wealth and money, same thing. Wealth, power, and fame is what he said. He said, the problem is, most people who have one of those things aren't happy or they can't handle it. And I can honestly say, I've met very few people who have those things who can handle them. There are some, but there's just not a lot of them. And he said, really where our happiness is, is in our ability to both give and receive love. The Surgeon General of the United States. And, and the reason I think that's important and to speak to some of our more technically minded listeners, this kind of thing sounds so squishy and gross. Like, oh, like, how am I going to be a good leader? Give and receive love. <laughs> well, <laughs> think of it like this, all right? The the guy who wrote the intro for my book, he sold a company for $10 billion. And he 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 went to the doctor because he was exhausted. And they said, you have a chemical makeup. He, this guy was 49 at the time. They said, you have a chemical makeup of an 85-year-old man. He had pushed himself to the brink of exhaustion for over 20 years. Wow. And he's an engineer. And he said, I've come to think of my body as a biochemical machine. Mm. And if you feel it correctly, it will operate correctly. So what makes your body work correctly? What makes bodies work correctly? What makes an organization work correctly? It's back to what the Surgeon General said. It's the ability to both give and receive love, which is about relationship, which is about openness, which is about care. It's about communication. It's about emotional health. And when we have those things, we multiply that kind of health in our organization because they look at us who set the pace, by the way, to see how it's done. And when we can create organizations of people who are settled and steady, our work will go much farther in the world. And on top of that, we'll be way happier along the way. You've heard it here, everyone. You've heard (laughs) it here from David. That's all I got to say. No, David, this has been a real treat. And I just want to let you know publicly, I've told you this privately, your gift Man, and thank you. Your gift that um, is extremely relevant. Uh, the world needs you, but something that really jumped out to me today, it's about being devoted and going after the one. Mm. Uh, you had mentioned your heart, your desire to go deeper with, in a sense, I'll call it the one before you, as opposed mm. to reaching the masses. 
And I just want to end this conversation by encouraging the listeners to say, if you want to reach the masses, be faithful with the one. Hmm. That's right. In other That's words, great. don't be as obsessed with the horizontal relationships, casting a, a net far and wide, trying to impact and influence everyone on planet Earth but be faithful with the one that's before you today. And when you are, you'll reap a reward because of a changed life, dare I say a transformational life in time um, as you continue to be who you are with a message deeply seated in your heart. Mm -hmm. So David, thank you so much. I appreciate furthering this conversation with future episodes and completely offline as well. Uh, Me blessings too. to you and your family.